Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is a delight to see a, a nice audience. I've been out on the road for several weeks, and I think every place I've gone, the audiences have been larger and the enthusiasm has been greater. It's, uh, it's time for a turning around of America, I guess we could say, and I'm certainly decided to be a part of that. <clears throat> Somebody said the natives are stirring. Yeah. Good for the natives, right. We hear a lot in our country today about the decline of America's educational system, and it certainly is declining, and there's reason why it is. And, and the situation can develop like what happened in this one family one day when a mother said to her son, you've got to go to school. And he said, no, I don't want to go to school. And she said, but you've got to go to school. And they kept arguing about it. You've got to go. I don't want to go, and back and forth. And finally, he said to her, uh, he said, look, he said, the teachers don't like me, the, the, the uh, janitor doesn't like me, the pupils don't like me, nobody likes me, I don't want to go to school. And she said, but you've got to go. And he finally said, well, give me two good reasons why I got to go to school. And she said, okay, two good reasons. You're 45 years old and you're the principal. And I love to tell the story about the other boy that went to uh, Sunday school and he came home from Sunday school and he said, Mom, he says, what a lesson they gave us today. This was really something. Oh, gee. She says, well, tell me about it. Tell me about it. He says, well, he said, it, it was the story about the Jewish people being chased out of Egypt by the Pharaoh's army. And he said that they were escaping, but the Pharaoh's army was catching up on them and it was getting tougher and tougher. And that they finally got up to the Red Sea and they couldn't get across and it was looking bad for them. So he says, so Moses got on his walkie-talkie and he called in the Israeli Air Force and they bombed the Egyptian army and then the Israeli Navy came across the sea and they rescued the people and took them to safety. And his mother looked at him and shook her head. <laughs> Is that what they taught you in Sunday school? And he said, well, no, Mom, but if I told you the way they told me, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> You, you, you see, the boy had been skeptical about something he should have believed. And here in our country today, we have so many, many people who are believing things when they should be skeptical. Right? What should they be skeptical about? Well, they should be skeptical about the leadership of our country. They should be skeptical about a lot of the policies that are being uh, uh, implanted and some that have been in existence for a long time. And I want to talk about some of them, and I want to start by going back to 1910. I go all the way back to 1910. In fact, to the fall of 1910, when seven individuals proceeded independently under instructions to make sure that they didn't come together, that they proceeded independently, and that they arrived as furtively as possible and as secretly as possible to a railroad car that was in New Jersey across the Hudson River from Manhattan and that they were to proceed there quietly. And when they got there, they were not to refer to each other by their names, but to use a code name or a nickname or even a first name. And make sure that nobody attaches you to one of the others. Because if any two of you had been seen together, it would have been suspect. There was extraordinary secrecy. And the seven men who went to that meeting, I can see them arriving with their collars up and their brims of their hats turned down and maybe even sunglasses, who knows. They got there and they boarded the train. The train, the car, it was simply one railroad car attached to a longer train. It was owned by a senator from Rhode Island named Nelson Aldrich. Nelson Aldrich's descendant, one of them, was Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. Now, the seven individuals, there were three of them from the Morgan Banking Interests, the J.P. Morgan Group. There was one from the Rockefeller Banking Interests. There was one who was an Assistant Secretary of the Treasury of the United States government. Another was Senator Aldrich himself. And the seventh individual was a man named Paul Warburg from Germany. He'd come to America. He was an agent of the Rothschild Banking Institutions. The purpose of the meeting was to establish a central bank in the United States, something that we didn't have and we hadn't had since Andrew Jackson had spent his entire presidency of eight years 
to destroy a central bank that had been started way back in that period. Andrew Jackson is somebody who is uh, somewhat discounted by uh, modern historians. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Jackson destroyed a central bank and paid off the national debt. Right? Now, the purpose of the meeting, as I say, was to establish a central bank. And the interesting, uh, the, the part of it that was important to these people was to follow in the footsteps of the founder of the Rothschild banking interests, a man named Meyer Amschel Rothschild, who 200 years previously had stated that all you need is to gain control of a nation's money. In fact, he said, give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. And indeed, he's correct about that, as we shall see. Now, the central bank that they started was not to be a government entity. It was to be a privately run entity. Out of the meeting, which was chaired and directed by Paul Warburg, who had experience with central banks from Europe, came the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is a private entity. We are told all the time that it is a quasi-government entity or it is a government entity or, or some other government involvement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no more a government entity than is the Federal Express Company. Just because the term federal is in its name does not make it a government agency. In fact, if you go to Washington, D.C. and you look in the telephone book and you see page after page after page of government entities, you will not find the Federal Reserve listed. And that by itself is not conclusive, but there's a lot more that is conclusive about it. Finally, the legislation was drawn, the ideas were formed, and the, uh, in, the legislation was introduced into the Congress of the United States. And it was passed by Congress on December 22nd of 1913. We had the Federal Reserve. The date is significant. 19, December 22nd of 1930, three days before Christmas, when many of the people who would have opposed the Fed had already left Washington to return to their districts in order to enjoy the Christmas holidays at home with family and friends. And those who didn't have to leave were from the liberal Northeast, where they could count on support for their ideas. And the Federal Reserve was created. It is a central bank in the United States. The idea for a central bank originated, of course, with Meyer Amschel Rothschild way back hundreds of years ago. But it is also codified in a document called the, Com the Communist Manifesto. In 1848, Marx and Engels decided to put together a plan to follow, to take economic power in a nation. And they codified what they wanted in the Communist Manifesto. We go to page 25 in this edition of it. You'll find copies of this on the book table. I hope some people will buy it. I hope you will read it. I hope you will understand that this is what is being implemented in the United States of America. And this, the Constitution of the United States, has been put on the shelf. The, the, the Communist Manifesto calls for a heavy progressive income tax. We got it in 1913. It calls in Plank 5 for centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank and an exclusive monopoly. And yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, we got that in 1913. But they went even beyond what Karl Marx had called for. He said, in the hands of the state. This is not in the hands of the state. This is a private entity. And there have been many over the years who've tried to get inside the Fed and tried to uh, fathom it and tried to disrupt its def destructive activities and so on. Nobody has succeeded. In 1983, a congressman from Texas named Wright Patman was the head of the House Banking Committee, a very powerful individual in the Congress. And in his frustration, he finally wrote to, him, to his constituents in one of his letters that went to his people back in Texas, in 1968 this was, and he said, in the United States today we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government, which would be of course the Congress, the presidency, the Supreme Court, and other courts. And then he said, we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System, operating the money powers which are reserved to the Congress by the Constitution. 
He couldn't do anything about it. Others had tried. There was a great congressman in the 30s named McFadden who tried very hard to upset the power of the Federal Reserve and died mysteriously. In 1969, only a few months after Wright Patman had issued his letter, we see that the Nixon administration had come to power and the, the new Secretary of the Treasury was a man named David Kennedy. David Kennedy was interviewed by U.S. News and World Report early in 1969 and, he, and the question and answer format question from the U.S. News and World Report, do you approve of the latest credit tightening moves of the Federal Reserve Board? Answer from the Secretary of the Treasury, it's not my job to approve or disapprove, it's the action of the Federal Reserve. Incredible power. The Federal Reserve has power to decide the amount of currency in our nation and therefore its value. They have the power to decide the interest rates. They can create upticks, downticks, they can create booms, they can create busts. And they can do so just prior to an election. And they have done that just prior to an election. For instance, the U.S. News and World Report tells us in 1988, this was the year, of course, that Ronald Reagan had to step aside. He had two terms and he couldn't run for re-election. So there was an open, seat, an open race for the presidency between George Bush and Michael Dukakis. And several months before the election, in fact, in July of 1988, a man named Monroe Carman wrote an article in the U.S. News and World Report and he said this. He said, in short, the central bank wants to strike a pose of neutrality for the contest between Bush and Dukakis. The Fed will neither plunge the economy into a recession, as Fed Chairman Volcker did in 1980 to sabotage Jimmy Carter's re-election chances, nor open up the spigots of the money, the money spigots wide, as Fed Chairman Arthur Burns did in 1972 to help Richard Nixon win another term. Now, you thought that you decided who was going to be the President of the United States, didn't you? And yet the Federal Reserve System has the power to shape the thinking of enough voters to make a difference when we go to the polls for Election Day for the Presidency of the United States. The Federal Reserve has vast powers. The Federal Reserve has a, a, a Loctite grip on the economic life of our country. It's all completely in contradistinction to the Constitution of the United States. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no way to fix this. There is no way to get the right people to run it. There is no way to transfer the powers to the government of the United States. The Federal Reserve System has to be abolished. <clears throat> and in its place, we go back to precious metal-backed currency issued by the United States Treasury which is what we had. Now this is all in complete distinction to the Constitution of the United States. Our country was born with the Declaration of Independence. Men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and to secure these rights, governments are instituted. What a beginning. It never happened before. There is a God, he gave us our rights. We used our powers, our rights, our individual liberties in order to form a government to protect those rights and nothing more. Not to redistribute the wealth, not to take control of the people, not to dominate the people, but simply to protect our rights. We formed that constitution eventually for only the purpose of mutual defense and a few housekeeping duties. That's all the constitution calls for. The Constitution of the United States doesn't limit you and me. See, we beat the British. We fought under the Articles in the, in the Continental Congress. We beat the British. We sent them back. Thank goodness. Right? It's not just because I have an Irish heritage that I enjoy the fact that we beat them. <laughs> that certainly enters into it. But. <laughs> the Constitution limits government, not you and me. Strictly defined powers are given and nothing more and only a few powers are given. And they sent it back to the states for ratification and the different states looked it over and some of the states said, not gonna even touch it. We're not gonna ratify this unless we get a guarantee you'll add to it a statement of what we believe our rights to be. North Carolina especially was emphatic about that. In North Carolina they said, you add to it a bill of rights or we're not gonna even entertain it. 
And so a promise was made, and weren't those amazing days? They, the politicians kept their promise, right? And the Bill of Rights was added to it. Congress shall make no law respecting freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and so on. Incredible. We didn't get those rights from the First Amendment, though, did we? We got them from God. And if you're in the habit of saying your First Amendment rights, stop right now. From now on, say God-given rights protected by the First, protected by the Fourth, protected by whatever. And there are people who tell me that the First Amendment is the most important, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so on. Forget it. That's not so. The most important is the Second. The Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, gives teeth. <laughs> All of the others are almost meaningless without the teeth. Well, this is our country, but what do we have today? God-given rights? No, government-given rights, right? They've thrown God out of the schools. They've thrown God out of public life. No national independence. They say we got to have world government, centralized government, world tyranny, United Nations, everything's going on, and it's totally wrong. And Americans should rise almost as if one and say no, and happily they are. And your audience here tonight is testimony to that. These audiences are growing as I travel the country. Everywhere I go, record-setting attendance. They haven't had crowds like this in 20 years, 25 years. It's great. It's just wonderful. I salute you. Thank you. But America is heading the wrong way. America is turning on her past. And it's not happening by accident. The John Burt Society calls it a conspiracy. You say conspiracy to many people today, and oh, they jump back in horror. Uh, you can't use that word. It was okay to use it during the Watergate conspiracy, wasn't it? <laughs> Why can't we use it again? Right? Well, you people see a, 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 a communist under every rock. No, no, no. But there are some rocks that have communists under them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there are some rocks that have CFR members, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, who is it that's doing this to us? Who's, who's changing America? Let's look at the president. Mr. Bill Clinton, in 1992, Mr. Bill Clinton accepted the Democrat nomination. And when he did so, in the course of his acceptance speech at that convention, he mentioned the name of Carol Quigley. He paid him a little bit of tribute, one of his professors at Georgetown University. Who, who's Carol Quigley? You go right across the country, John Burt Society members from coast to coast. Did you hear what he said? He said Carol Quigley. We know who he was. Well, who is he? Well, Carol Quigley wrote this book. I carry it around with me. I'm getting sloping shoulders. <laughs> I call it Carol Quigley's Revenge. <laughs> Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, a book published in 1966. Bill Clinton was a sophomore at, at Georgetown University at the time. Bill Clinton praised this man. Did he come in contact with this book? I have no doubt that he did. What does the book say? The book describes a conspiracy to rule the world, except that the author doesn't call it a conspiracy. He calls it a secret network. He calls it a secret society. And in doing so, he's honest. Carol Quigley did not believe it was evil. He thought it was fine. It was wonderful that, this is, that these privileged individuals should run the world. You see, a conspiracy has three elements. Secrecy, more than one person, and evil. If you believe that this is a secret thing and it's more than one person, but it's not evil, you don't use the word conspiracy. And so Carol Quigley, in all honesty, published his research, and his research is very valuable. It corroborates our view that indeed it is a conspiracy. Now, what did he say? Well, he traced it from 1870 at Oxford University in England. And I would go beyond that. I would say that it began before that, but Quigley only knew it from that point on. In 1870, a professor named John Ruskin arrived at Oxford University in England. He took the campus by storm. He imbued many of his students with a, a, a wondrous idea that they were the privileged ruling class. And he told them that they were the possessors of a proud tradition of, of beauty and education and the rule of law and so on, and that the world would be better off if it were run by them. 
Now, of all of his students, the one who was most taken with what Carol Quigley had to say was a, a youngster named Carol, uh, Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes, who was later to go to Southern Africa with the help of the Rothschilds and exploit the diamond and gold mines out there, become fabulously wealthy. He was the man who carried out the designs of John Ruskin more than anyone. Their purposes, according to Quigley, centered on the desire to federate the English-speaking peoples of the world and to bring all of the habitable portions of the world under their control. And so they formed a secret network, a secret society. And that's his term, not mine. It, it was formed along conspiratorial guidelines. Any conspiracy will have concentric circles of power and influence. They had an inner circle. They had an outer circle. The inner circle they formed in the late 1800s, the outer circles they began to form in the early 1900s. Quigley tells us in 1919 they formed the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England and similar institutes of international affairs in British dominions, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa. And then he said, and they also formed a similar institute in the United States where it is called the Council on Foreign Relations. Now the Council on Foreign Relations is an organization that dominates America today and many Americans don't understand that. This is an organization of only 3,000 individuals. It was formally put together in 1921 by a man, Edward Mandel House, who said he was working for socialism, as dreamed of by Karl Marx in a book that he'd written. The Council on Foreign Relations today can find among its members the top leaders of government. They're close to 400 in the Clinton administration and Clinton himself. There are men in the top echelons of all elements of the media and the government and the military and the academic world and the corporate world and so forth. It's the who's who in America. And they constantly set the agenda for the American people. You can discuss within their agenda, but don't talk about something outside of their agenda because if you do, you're an extremist. Right? You might even be labeled an isolationist, right? which is perfectly okay with me. They were constantly harping, says Quigley, on the lessons to be learned from the failure of the American Revolution. Failure? I don't consider it a failure. I mean, in addition to our nation not being free and independent, we'd all be speaking with a British accent. I wouldn't want that. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, what would I say if I ever met the Queen of England? And I'd say, hello, Queen. It's terrible what you people have done to our language. <laughs> I think that would go over like a lead balloon. <laughs> what was the goal of this secret network formed by Quigley? Let me read to you what he says. Nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Wow. <laughs> Just stop and think about that. What an ambitious undertaking. A world system of financial control in private hands. Private hand, that's key. Able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. That's total world power, isn't it? Well, it's also in different words with Meyer Amschel Rothschild had said. He said, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. Carol Quigley's book was meant for academic institutions, for young students who might aspire to become a part of this, for uh, other professors. The John Birch Society discovered it. We became its greatest customer. <laughs> the publisher refused another edition. Carol Quigley was wild. Why not? He wanted the royalties, if nothing else. Well, somebody else he contracted with finally out in the West Coast. And before he died, Carol Quigley became aware that what he had been talking about wasn't so red hot after all. And what he had been talking about was indeed evil. And before he died, I'm persuaded from what I've read of this man that he understood that it was indeed a conspiracy. Tough way to have to learn it, though. Right? Look at the damage you've done to your country. Bill Clinton mentioned this man as, as, as one of his teachers in his acceptance speech in 1960, uh, 1992. 
having been a graduate of Georgetown University way back then. Bill Clinton aspired to go to become a part of Rhodes Scholarship Program that he started at those universities in England. See, Rhodes had left a fabulous fortune and seven separate wills, and two of his wills were left for the purpose of establishing a Rhodes Scholarship Program. Quigley wrote another book, which wasn't published until he died, a book called The Anglo-American Establishment. And in this book, he tells us what the Rhodes Scholarship Programs are all about. I'll read one sentence for you. The scholarships, Quigley says, were merely a facade to cover the secret society. Or, more accurately, they were to be one of the instruments by which members of the secret society could carry out the purposes of Cecil Rhodes. Well, Bill Clinton left Georgetown University, aspired to, and became a Rhodes Scholar. Came back to America, went to Yale Law School. That's where he met what's-her-name. <laughs> went back to Arkansas and ingratiated himself into politics, became the governor of Arkansas and then became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and then became a member of its stepchild, the Trilateral Commission. And in 1991, he was brought to Europe to a meeting of the Bilderbergers. And undoubtedly, there are some people in the audience who are saying to themselves, what the heck is that? Is that something you get at Wendy's? Well, in 1954, David Rockefeller and one of his friends, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, decided to form an organization, and they would invite to it on an annual basis for an annual meeting the leaders of the Western world, the leaders from Western Europe and the United States. And they had the first meeting in 1954 at the Hotel de Bilderberg in Oosterbeck in the Netherlands, and so the meetings from thenceforth were called the Bilderberger meetings. That's all that it means. They have met annually every year since, with one exception. And they have taken over a plush resort somewhere, and they have put guards around the place. Nobody in, nobody out, nobody who is part of it talk to the press. Nobody tell anybody what's going on. Well, the uh, Bilderbergers have met in the United States. They've met at uh, uh, St. Simons Island in Georgia, at Williamsburg in Virginia, at Woodstock, Vermont, Lawrence Ro Rockefeller's place up there. And they have uh, invited the top leaders of our country and Western European nations. And the purpose of the meetings are simply to plan how the world should be run. Now, in 1991, Bill Clinton was brought to a meeting of the Bilderbergers. He was showcased before them. He obviously received a nod of approval. He came back to the United States of America, and he was permitted to be a president of the United States. Now, let me say that with due emphasis. He was permitted to be the president of our nation by Europeans. You think you and I decide. Ladies and gentlemen, for my lifetime, others have decided who's going to be our president, and Bill Clinton is one of them. That's the way it works. That's the way it has worked for a long, long time. Bill Clinton has all of the credentials of the people who want the New World Order. He's Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Rhodes Scholar, Bilderberger. And in 1992, when he was running for the presidency to get the nomination, he was opposed by five other Democrats. Remember? Jerry Brown, Paul Songus, Harkin from Iowa, Kerry from Nebraska, and uh, Jesse Jackson, how many of those individuals pointed to the fact that George Bush had the same credentials? That George Bush had come out of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission and had been to Bilderberger meetings? How many of them did it? None of them did it. Why not? Well, there are two reasons why not. One reason is they want those credentials for themselves. And the second reason is that they fear the power of those organizations. In 1914, a book was published written by then President Woodrow Wilson. And in that book, Woodrow Wilson said, there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. That power existed way back then, ladies and gentlemen, and it exists today and is even more powerful. And if you combat it, stand by. Look what happened to Pat Buchanan in 1992. He took it on, 
All of a sudden, overnight, he was an anti-Semite, wasn't he? He was an isolationist. He was a crackpot. He was an extremist. The John Birch Society had taken it on years before. And everything we did wasn't to talk about it above our breath in guarded tones. We went to the top of the roof and we shouted it out from the housetops. And look what they said about us. Right? Did they combat our, our, our information? Did they say you're wrong about it? No, no. What did they say? Racist, anti-Semite, extremist, crackpot, kook, fanatic. And like the communists, like the Klan, like the... I've known it all. Nobody knows it better than I, other than Robert Welsh, who is now passed on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's not true. Not a whit of it. But that's what you can expect. But the beauty of the situation is that we took on that power. We survived that smear. We made it possible for many, many others to come in behind us. And we ourselves continued to progress. What is it that they're looking for? Ladies and gentlemen, very simply, they're looking for the new world order. They're looking for socialism and world government. Not necessarily communism, socialism and world government. I do a lot of radio shows for the John Birch Society, and I don't know how many times in recent years somebody has started off a show with a little bit of a snicker in his voice, and he'd say, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have today a guest from the John Birch Society, Mr. McManus, welcome, and my question for you right off the top is, What's the Birch Society doing these days now that communism is dead? <laughs> and my response has always been, you say communism is dead? I disagree. It's alive in China, Cuba, North Korea, Berkeley, California, Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I would get grudging acceptance of that. I would say, well, you say that communism is dead, but of course the entity that has just faded away was the Union of Soviet Communist Republics, wasn't it? USCR. No, it wasn't. It was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And I'd let it sit. And I'd say, well, aren't you going to ask me what socialism is? Yeah, what's socialism? I said, it's economic control of the people by government. Taxation, regulations, controls, bureaucracy, big brother government. And er, invariably, before I finish my little scenario here, he's saying to me, well, that's what we're getting here in America. And I say, thank you very much. You've made my case. <laughs> At some times, I'd say to him, I'd say, well, why don't you ask me the difference between a communist and a socialist? Oh, okay, Mr. McManus, what's a communist? What's the difference? I said, it's very simple. A communist is a socialist in a hurry. <laughs> now you stop and think about that. All right, the Communist Manifesto was written for communists and socialists. In fact, the, the, the manifesto was republished in 1888, 40 years after it had been issued, and a new preface was written by Engels. Marx was in his grave, and the new preface is published in our edition of this. And what does it say? It says, when it was written, we could not have called it a socialist manifesto because there were some quacks running around Europe at the time calling themselves socialists. We didn't want to associate with them, so we called it the Communist Manifesto. What does it call for, ladies and gentlemen? It calls for an abolition of, of property rights explicitly. It calls for an abolition of the family. It calls for replacing home education by social. How many of you realize this is an explicit attack on home education in the Communist Manifesto? It's there, page 22. They attack bourgeois marriage. They attack countries and nationalities. They abolish re eternal truths, religion, all morality. And then you get to the 10 planks. What do you see? Heavy progressive income tax. We got it. Centralization of credit in the hands of a National Bank, we've got it, the Federal Reserve System. Abolition of property and land. Anybody in California feeling that? Right? <laughs> uh, abolition of the rights of inheritance. Bill Clinton's deficit reduction package. You talk about truth and labeling, my goodness. Deficit reduction package. Right? More, more attacks on the rights of inheritance. Finally, we get the free education for all children in public schools. Ladies and gentlemen, Karl Marx wanted what we've got. And in so many ways, this is being implemented in the United States, and the Constitution is being shelved. And I contend in many ways that if you took the covers off these two and you presented them to some congressman, they wouldn't know the difference. 
And some of them would choose this and say, well, yes, this is obviously what we're doing, so this must be our document, right? We are in deep trouble, ladies and gentlemen. All right. How do you get the American people to give up their liberty? The people who live in this country are the greatest beneficiaries of freedom in all history. We live in a nation. <clears throat> We live in a nation that could be correctly described as the greatest experiment in human liberty in all of mankind. And we're losing it. Not to Moscow, not to Peking, not to Havana. We're losing it to Washington, D.C. And I always think of what Joe McCarthy used to say. He said, I love to leave Washington and get back to America. How do you get Americans to give it up? Well, you corrupt some of them and you got them. Yeah, you can corrupt people and you get them. And you can buy some and many have been bought, haven't they, with government programs and government handouts and government this and government that. Not only individuals, but corporations. Favorite contracts and so on. But the greatest way of getting the American people, the ordinary American, to give up his liberty was to scare the wits out of them. And didn't we have those scares? We had communism, didn't we? Communism aiming its missiles at our cities and the people in America being told over and over again, better red than dead. How's that for alternatives? Right? You can live under communism or you can become an ash in a nuclear holocaust. Is there no other alternative? Right? Certainly there is another alternative, but you weren't supposed to think about that. That's what they do to us all the time, false alternatives. The other alternative is to stay free and, and stand up against this threat and to tell our government to stop giving the communists the wherewithal to aim those missiles at us. You see, what happened over the years is that the John Birch Society had distributed tens of millions of pieces of evidence showing the American people, anybody who'd listen, that what the Soviets had in military might, we gave them. We gave them the missiles, we gave them the plans, we gave them the parts, we gave them the technology, we gave them the money. And many Americans began to realize that this whole thing was a fraud. And so it kind of faded from the scene, didn't it? Now, I don't mean to tell you that communism is gone. It could come back tomorrow from Red China. It could even emerge again from Russia. The way the media has our country in its grasp but of course, as we grow stronger and stronger, that media becomes less and less powerful. Let's continue to do that. So communism didn't take, it didn't do the job, it didn't scare us into giving up our liberty to a world government to protect us and to have peace. So what's the next threat? The next threat was environmentalism. Right? We have global warming. You and I are burning too much fuel in our cars and in our homes and in our factories. We're putting up a canopy of soot over the earth and the heat that we generate can't go off into space. Therefore, the earth is heating up. And if it continues, the polar ice caps are going to melt and we're going to have beachfront property right here in Walnut Creek. Right? Well, that's part of what they tell us. It's totally absurd. It is pure and unadulterated hokum. The earth is not heating up. There's temperature readings that have been taken across the globe, ten thousands of stations every day for over a hundred years. And the data is available and it shows there is no warming and there is no cooling. And so if it's not global warming, then it's ozone depletion or it's some little furry creature running under the ground. Or it's the spotted owl. My goodness, the spotted owl. I was in Iowa recently and I'd like to pass on to you what I saw there. It was dramatic. It was a billboard right along the main highway through Des Moines and it had a picture of a fetus and next to it it simply said if only I had been a spotted owl <laughs> how did all of this environmental hysteria generate where did it come from ladies and gentlemen in 1962 the people who would rule our world and have us be slaves had 15 of their men go to a meeting held at a place called Iron Mountain just north of New York City. They met for a period of three years on and off and they finally decided 
at the end of it, they were finished, they put together a report. The purpose of the meeting was to develop an alternative to nuclear weapons to scare you and me into accepting their rule, very simply. One of the men in the group took the report, which was not intended for public consumption, and he brought it to a, a printer and they printed it up, the report from Iron Mountain. The man was John Kenneth Galbraith. He's the only one that we've ever found, it was amongst the 15. I want to read just one sentence to you, and it gives you the birth of the environmental movement. Here we are, 1965 they finished, published in 1967, and it says, it may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal apparent threat to the survival of the species. They even said apparent, didn't they? It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal apparent threat to the survival of the species. That gave birth to the environmental hysteria that we see all around us. Well, happily, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of scientists are speaking out about this. Competent scientists who usually speak to each other in their own journals are now speaking to the general public. And some of them have put out very, very important treatises showing the fraudulent nature of this whole movement. Now, I don't mean to say in any way that the environmental threat is behind us. No, it's still there. It has to be combated. You'll find information on our book table to help you combat it. But what's the next threat? What's the next way of forcing us to accept total world government? The next one, ladies and gentlemen, is not a fraud, it's debt. The massive indebtedness of the United States of America, now four and a half trillion dollars. What's a trillion dollars? Right? It's, it's, it's almost meaningless. It's such a vast number. What is it, 12 zeros? I mean, well, let me try to make it intelligible. If I owed a trillion dollars and I wanted to pay it off at a million a day every day without interest being considered at all, one million dollars a day, it would take me 2,740 years to do it. That's what a trillion dollars is. Our nation says four and a half trillion, and it's, that's true. We do owe that. We're paying 300 billion in interest on that. And again, it's a meaningless number. What does it mean? $300 billion. Well, there's 250 million of us in this country, a little long division, and bingo, what do you get? $1,200 for every man, woman, and child, and it's going up. And that's just for interest on an annual basis, and it doesn't pay off the salaries of the officials. It doesn't pay off any of the debt. It's just interest. But of course, only half of us pay taxes, so you've got to double it if you're a taxpayer. $2,400 per year, on average, just for interest on the national debt, 200 a month, and it's going up. And they keep telling us that they're doing everything they possibly can to, to cut spending and to uh, lower the deficits, right? Here's, here's Bill Clinton. Look at this headline. Clinton vows more trims in spending, right? That's as good as his marriage vow. I contend that if you go to a fourth grader and you say, young lady, young man, our country is 200 billion in debt, should we give away money? The fourth grader would say no, and the boy might say no, you dummy. We need fourth graders in Congress, yes. We still have a foreign aid program, 13 billion. We have a commodity credit program, another form of foreign aid, 25 billion. We have a, a form of foreign aid that nobody wants to talk about it being foreign aid. We station troops in Japan, in South Korea, in Germany, and we accept their defense budgets as ours. And that adds up to hundreds of billions of dollars every year. Why should we do that? Japan's an economic power. South Korea has become one. Germany's an economic power. In addition to that, we have troops in Somalia. We have them in Macedonia. We have them in the Middle East. We now have planes flying and shooting down people in, in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, what's the Birch Society got to say about all this? Very simple. Bring the troops home. Bring them home. <laughs> We used to say a liberal was somebody generous with other people's money. And we can still say that. But a liberal is also generous with other people's sons and daughters and fathers and husbands 
and sisters and mothers and so on. Somebody asked me in a call-in show recently, should we have a seat for Poland in NATO? And I said, absolutely, give them ours. We now face socialized medicine, a huge program, one-seventh of the gross national product of the United States in medical care. And they want to make it completely socialized, take over government in every aspect of it. Ladies and gentlemen, incredible. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. There's a bumper sticker that says, if you think medical care is expensive, just wait till it's free. <laughs> yeah. Hillary Clinton went to the Congress and the Congressman said to her, Mrs. Clinton, if, you intend, if your program succeeds, you will put tremendous burdens on small and medium-sized business. You will destroy a lot of small and medium-sized business. And you know what she said? She said, I cannot be responsible for saving every undercapitalized American entrepreneur. She should have been thrown right out of Congress. She should have been thrown out of this country. They don't intend to cut the deficit. They don't intend to pay off the debt. They don't intend to reduce the tax burden. They don't intend to allow us to be free. Which brings me to my book, Financial Terrorism, Hijacking America Under the Threat of Bankruptcy. The threat of bankruptcy, not bankruptcy itself. And there is where I begin to differ with so many of these other economic analysts. I don't think they intend bankruptcy. I think they intend to bring us up to the door of bankruptcy and then come through with their solution to our problem. And their solution is a world monetary system, world government, the new world order. And they say so. I've got quotes from Brzezinski and Richard Nixon and Richard Gardner and, and Samuel Huntington and Richard Cooper and Paul Volcker and all of these characters. The, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission gurus from Washington, D.C., over and over again, they're telling us what they intend, a world monetary system. C. Fred Bergston, head of the International Economics uh, Institute in Washington, D.C., the world economy is in trouble unless there is some central steering mechanism. They want a world Federal Reserve System. What are they doing to us? I had a friend up in northern New Hampshire. I used to go visit him every chance I got. He was a wonderful man. He's deceased now. And he told me one day, this has to be 10, 12, 15 years ago. I can't remember for sure. He said, you know, Jack, he says, I've just read, reread the blue book of the John Birch Society. You remember that part where Robert Welsh made the predictions about what was going to happen? I said, I think so. What, what do you mean? He says, well, the first prediction, he said, was that the United States government was going to spend money for every conceivable purpose on earth and they were going to spend it as wastefully as possible in order to uh, 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 accumulate massive debt. I said, I do remember that, yes. He said, well, I figured it out. What, what's it all about? What are, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that for this reason, he said. He said, debt is followed by borrowing. Borrowing is followed by the need for interest. Interest is followed by the need for taxation to pay the interest, and taxation means control of the American people. Very simple. Debt. Borrowing, interest, taxation, gotcha. Right? And is that what they're doing? Of course. You see, a communist means to take control of you with one fell swoop, and he will do that, and when he does it, he, he sets up 98, 99% of the people hate him and, and are his resisting. And he has to form gulags and, and KGBs and, and secret police and knocks on the door in the middle of the night and terror and so on. But a socialist... A socialist will get you to vote yourself into the condition and he will destroy resistance in the process. That's what's happening to us, ladies and gentlemen. The Communist Manifesto, the Bible of every socialist and every communist who ever lived, is being fastened around America. And we've got to stop it. What are they spending the money for? Well, I'm glad you're seated. Two million dollars to study why truck drivers lose alertness at the wheel. I could have saved the two million, they get tired. <laughs> 49 million for a rock and roll museum. 637 for a New York State Arts Council to fund homosexual films. 225,000 for an onion storage facility at the University of Georgia. I'm not making this up. 
I wish I were. 603,000 for pickle research at North Carolina State University. Half a million to McDonald's Corporation to promote chicken McNuggets. 2.3 to the Gallo Brothers to promote their wines. Here's one, you got 1.2 million for African elephant conservation. Elephants, huh? I'll bet the Republicans were behind that one, right? <laughs> 11 million for the United States Institute of Peace. What an insult to teach the people in our country to want peace. Ladies and gentlemen, people don't start wars. Governments do. They send the people to fight and die in the wars. If indeed they've spent the 11 million to teach governments not to start wars, I, I'd go along with it. $34 million for the National Fertilizer Research Center. They had to locate that on Capitol Hill, I think. <laughs> I talk all the time, wherever I can, about false alternatives being given to us. Better red than dead is a good example. Right? Well, I've got a chapter here on missing alternatives. I start off with a quotation from Shakespeare. Shakespeare in The Taming of the Shrew said, there's small choice in rotten apples. <laughs> well put, Will. <laughs> Right. Are there no decent good apples? Well, yes. What are the bad apples? More debt or world government? What is a good apple? Well, a good apple is very easy. How about freedom? Economic freedom, less government, pay off the debt, leave the people alone. On and on we go. I've got two chapters about inflation. We're told every day, and you hear it on television more and more, 